Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you're in the world, I'd like to welcome you to 2022 and uh, our first seminar of the year. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to get uh, GD Ogumbo from uh, currently in Korea, where it's one o'clock in the morning. So I'm doubly pleased that GD has found the time to speak to us. But before we, we talk about GD in today's uh, presentation, let me just remind you to go on the MTNet to MNRs page where you'll see uh, prior uh, links to vi the videos and presentations, and also registration links for uh, upcoming ones. You are on a, a Zoom webinar, so you can send a chat to, to us. Uh, you can send a Q&A and please, if you have a question, send a Q&A to the presenter. Um, if JD sees that, he might answer on the fly or, or might answer at the end of the webinar. And then at the end, if you want to get into discussion and we promote this, we, we like to have discussions during the seminars, please raise your hand and I'll make you available to speak. So today's, whoops, uh, before I talk about today, just a quick advertisement for next week. Next week, uh, we have Hans Rudi Maurer. Um, uh, who, who's an hour later, who's going to be speaking on helicopter-borne ground penetrating radar surveys on Alpine glaciers. So that's a quick advertisement for next week's uh, seminar. But, but this week we have Gino Gumbo, who's going to talk to us about a really interesting topic, and that's uh, monomodel graining constrained multi-physics inversion. And, and uh, Gino will tell us all about that. But before he does, let me tell you a little bit about J.D. He's currently a brain Korean professor at Seoul National University. Research philosophy is to optimize the uh, geophysical methods to improve imaging solutions in accuracy and efficiency. Um, performs multi-physics of different complementary models. And this is where I think we in the MT world, we have to go, or EM world, we have to go into these multi-physics methods. And it's been demonstrated uh, joint inversion of seismic travel time and EM time frequency domain, EM data, gravity, gradient. So he's currently researching the use of artificial neural networks for a Bayesian Monte Carlo interpretation of amplitude variation with offset in vertically trans, uh, transverse isotopic media. So at that, I'll stop sharing and invite Jide to, to share your screen and to give us your stamina. Right, good day, everyone. I hope my I'm audible enough. Yes, we can hear you. All right, all right. Uh, I have my screen there. I would like to welcome everyone to my presentation. And first off, I want to thank uh, Professor Allen and the the organizer of this uh, eminent. It's uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful platform to share knowledge and to also gain knowledge thank you so much so i have here with me um, the presentation that is titled monomodal gremium constrained multi physics inversion of electromagnetic data uh, like uh, i've uh, i've been said my name is gide nasakari gumbo brain career professor at the seoul national university south korea uh, so at uh, the Department of uh, College of Engineering, I have this content to, to go through that is going to guide me. I'm going to introduce the whole concept that I want to discuss. And then I, the next item will be to talk about the multi-physics inversion philosophy and the implementation. And the category is a multi or monomodal multi physics inversion. I'm going to be interchangeably using multi physics and joint inversion is, is they are the same. Yeah, so sometimes you hear me call multi physics and another time joint inversion. Uh, we have the third item on the content is a uh, gremium constrained multi physics inversion. I'm going to give a synthetic example out of many that I have done. And then I'm going to wrap up that with a few examples from Book Ponong, Airborne Time and Frequency Domain Electromagnetic Data from the South 
Australia. And of course, finally, I'm going to conclude. Now going to the introduction, uh, we are gonna examine the challenges inherent in, in virtue in general. Um, there are two basic geophysical preoccupations, broadly speaking, and that those are modeling and inversion. When you, when you look at a geophysical company or institute, we are basically doing either modeling or inversion. We can do other things with them. Basically, those two items are on the list for us. And by modeling, we, we talk about when we are in control of the parameters and we have something that is called a forward operator. And then we supply the parameters into the forward operator to give us data. Uh, the reverse is true for the inversion, where you have the data, either it is synthetic or um, field data, you have prepared an inverse operator, and then you're expected to get some parameters that have produced that data. Why? Why the modeling is very straightforward and easy. The inversion is not that simple. Yeah, because you're in control of parameters here. Whatever you have is a function of the forward operator. And that is what you should care about, the forward operator. But the inversion, even if you care so much about this inverse operator, um, you are not guaranteed of getting very stable, reliable, or unique results. Um, so we, we go to the associated cost issues for these two items. For modeling, we have the cost of a computational efficiency. People tend to improve on the computational efficiency uh, every time, and also the accuracy improvement as well. But for the inversion, there are issues relating to existence of solution the stability of the solution, and also the uniqueness of the solution, uh, which, is, which are more serious for us. Now, we, I go to the contemplation of today, which is my own focus today, and that is on inversion. Uh, we, we should be able to uh, examine the fundamental issues or questions that relate to our inversion. Like I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, we have the existence, non-existence, uh, the solution can either exist or not. And we have stability, uh, it, it can either be stable or not. And the solution might either be unique or non-unique. So when we talk about existence, the question to ask first is that does a solution even exist? And that has to deal with the mathematical formulation of the inverse problem. Uh, from the physical point of view, if you go to the field and acquire data over a geological structure, uh, we know that there is a geological structure. It is real, but uh, we don't have a means other than performing inversion on the data that we expect. So we rely on mathematics. So from the mathematical point of view, there may not be adequate numerical model that will feed our data, particularly when it is noisy data. So noise in the data has no common ground with geophysical field equations. So the field equations, the forward operators uh, are just for the data, they are not for noise. So the, the noise content can, can make us to lose the existence of our solution. So that's, that's the existence issue. We have another issue with inversion and that's stability. And if we add a small perturbation to data, and if that gives us a bit real, large perturbation of the solution, we talk about an unstable solution. It shouldn't be, but if you, if you experience that, then we have to, we have an unstable solution. The next thing is a non-unique or unique solution. Uh, and that seems to be 
inherent an inherent problem uh, for the invasion. Uh, we, we have a situation where two or more different models, sources, it's the same data. And Jackson gave us the cause of non-uniqueness. He said that uh, when you have inaccurate, insufficient, or inconsistent data, that can lead to non-uniqueness. So you have two model parameters that tell you that give you the same data, like uh, x raised to power two equals to y. If x, uh, if x is two, if y is four. If the same x is minus two, y is four. That's confusing, it's not unique. So that's, a, that's, that's another issue with uh, the inversion problem. And if any of these things exist, or if any of these um, factors, is present, we now have what is called the new post inversion problem. And how do we solve a new post problem? That is that is a major problem to actually analyze. Now, there have been several proposals on how to solve this problem. Now, we, we, we will start with existence. Uh, Jedanov 2015, uh, talked about uh, practical existence. It, it, because I mentioned already that noise cannot be described by the same operator for data. So there is no need for us to overfit the data. So uh, he now said, okay, what about uh, practical existence that is fitting within the measurement error bound? So when you notice and you have the error bound, you don't overfit it. And that makes sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. So that means we have found a solution to the existence problem. Just ensure that you don't overfit your data and that is the solution to non-existent is understandably practical existence. So we can easily deal with existence issue now. What about uh, stability issue? Uh, we have a Tikhonov regularization theory. Uh, when an inversion problem is not stable. Mathematically speaking, that means that the inverse operator is not continuous. And that gives us ill posed problem. And uh, we need stabilizer to make the inversion stable. And we, uh, the stabilizer application is, for, is helping us to select from the set of possible solutions. We don't search all the solution space, but we just, we are restricted to a particular set of solutions. And the solutions that continuously depend on the data and, and which possesses a specific property depending on the choice of stabilizer. So the solution to instability is regularization. And that will condition the ill post problem to well post problem. It means that the inverse operator is ensured and, uh, uh, and conditioned to all to be always continuous. That is that a very brilliant uh, contribution by Tikhonov that he gave to us. The regularization algorithm will aim to consider instead of one ill post unregularized inverse problem, a family of well posed problems. So we've been able to solve existence problem and as as well as uh, um, stability or, or instability problem. So the, we, we need objective function to help us solve this problem. And that is called the regularized inversion. Uh, to stabilize such inversion, a regularized parametric function can be written as a linear combination. If you look at equation one, we, we will now have um, the parametric function is a linear combination of the misfit function, which is the first time on the right hand. And then we have the stabilizing function on the, on the, uh, the second time on the right hand side. And the, the alpha there is, is the regularization term. So this problem helps us, I mean, this objective function helps us to stabilize our solution. 
And we, the P, I mean, the, the term on the left hand side is the fictional parametric function for the model parameter M. That's why uh, this one is going to ensure that our solution is stable. And how do we get our solution out of this? Is by setting the equation and then minimizing it. And that's given by, by equation two. Uh, yeah, you know, we've already talked about uh, uh, existence and uh, we have also talked about stability issue. Now, what about uniqueness issue? There are several of uh, uniqueness theories that work for only certain geophysical models. That's what Jedanov 2015 have said. They, they have some theories, but they, it, it's uh, unfortunately limited to certain geophysical models. So uh, Jedanov proposed uh, practical uniqueness as well. Uh, it's now saying that uh, you must ensure that the geometrical dimension of your data acquisition is at least the same as that for the inverted models. It means that if you if you aim to invert 3D geometry, I mean the model parameters from 3D space, you cannot afford to use 2D, uh, you cannot afford to acquire your data over 2D geometry. So at least the data must be acquired on 3D space. Uh, if it is 4D, if it is a higher dimension, then the model is even better. So that's what uh, Jedanov called practical uniqueness. Uh, so we, we now go to the multi physics inversion of philosophy and the implementation. In this case, we are going to be examining the multi model, um, multi model, and mono model multi-physics inversion. The multi-physics joint inversion will now help us to tackle the non-uniqueness. You should recall that I mentioned that Jedanov 2015 proposed practical uniqueness, whereas you will need a higher dimension to acquire your data than that of the motor parameter. And that could be painfully expensive and is, it may not be very affordable. So it makes it very restrictive. So researchers have come uh, with other suggestions uh, that will help us to tackle the non-uniqueness problem by performing what is called a joint inversion. This is when you use multiple data sets and uh, you are multiple geophysical approaches, techniques or methods to solve the problem. Instead of trying to acquire uh, in a higher dimension, okay, what about if we now, if we have um, an objective function that is multi-physics in nature, and therefore n data set and model parameters, we can now have a third term, so equation one, and that's the coupling term there. Uh, that gives us equation three. You see that in equation one is just a linear combination of the data misfit and as well as the regularization term. Now for the motor physics, we have the coupling that couples all the interacting motor parameters. So if you have N motor parameters, this coupling is going to help us to uh, supply the information into the objective function. And the Tikhonov, we can update the Tikhonov parametric function in equation one with, uh, with the third term here, and we have equation three. And this C is the general representation of joint inversion of multi physics constraints or coupling terms, and is weighted by the beta here. And the C can be any of the constraints that are used, or you can even create your own if you, if you feel like. Uh, you have a full understanding of what you're doing. And then it can be cross graded structural constraint. It can be linear constraint. It can be tetraphysical constraint. It can be any of the constraints that you want. So these are some of the, uh, the this slide presents or shows us some of the uh, motor physics constraints that have been used, that have been published. 
the popular one is a cross gradient. And it is so because it's useful where physical properties are not correlated, but nevertheless have similar structure constraints, structural constraints. Yeah, so the list is growing, but uh, I can only list this one for this presentation. There are petrophysical uh, relations where you connect, uh, you can you can connect or define the relationship between seismic velocity and density and all of that so that you can constrain and force your inversion to act in a certain way to select some solutions based on the constraints that you're imposing. There are forces theming and we have the Gramian constraint, which is my, which is my own focus in this presentation. And that one, is uh, minimization of the determinants of what we call the gram the gram matrix is different from cross gradient. Cross gradient uh, doesn't need any correlation uh, before it is applied, but uh, Gramian will tell you that there is certain correlation between the interacting models, and it helps you to exploit and then to other things. You don't you don't need to supply any information. The, Gramian constraint will do that during inversion, and then you will see the relationship between interacting models. So that, that's very impressive. Uh, so that's what I will present later, but uh, that's just a summary of the constraint there. Now, the, the joint inversion philosophy um, have been implemented in several ways. And uh, the table two presents a summary of what uh, have been done that I've seen so far. So we have a um, mono model that is your, your target is to invert the same parameter, the same model parameter, but you can use different methods, different approaches, or just to target the same um, uh, model parameter. For instance, you see the first, the first uh, row I mean, the second row here, the monomoda, and you have data, the type of data that are used, they are similar. They use direct current, uh, DC method, and also the electromagnetic method. Both of them are, are going to give you conductivity or resistivity. So the same model parameter, but different methods, and they is used by both Bos Bosov and Duke 1975. Uh, another type of monomodel in joint inversion is when you combine multiple approaches on the same data set. So you are trying to look at the, this, yeah, this, you are trying to analyze the data from this angle and that from that angle or from this perspective, it's like uh, using the MT, you know, the MT you want to use the surface data to, and also look at the real, it's uh, the real component and the imaginary component. On the same data, you're trying to view it in different directions. So this uh, John 1997 used the refraction travel time migration, and then the tomographic inversion as well on the same data. So they, and of course, they, we, they're expecting velocity from the two different approaches. So it's still monomodal target. The same model is expected, but multimodal is when you expect different models at the end of the analysis, and you have um, you're using different approaches. Like uh, you can use seismic and EM, and then you're expecting seismic to give you velocity while EM will give you resistivity. And uh, this is multimodal, and a lot of people. Already doing that. So I give a list of uh, uh, motor model, motor model joint inversion, a few examples. And as and next, I'll give the mono model joint inversion examples and the constraints that are being applied. Galado and Major, uh, they have popularized uh, the use of cross gradient, and uh, most of their publications deal with DC resistivity as the first method. And the second method is seismic uh, travel time. And, and of, of course, they are expecting resistivity and the velocity. And Wumbo et al. Uh, 
we we use seismic travel time and electromagnetic uh, methods. We impose uh, cross gradient that structural changes. Uh, we impose that. Here at all, 2009, they used EM and seismic with the same cross gradient. Uh, Qatar, Nick Oslan at all, 2015, they used seismic gravity. You see, they, they are combining two different, two or more different uh, data sets, and they get uh, different uh, uh, model parameters as well. Forces C mean, uh, Gao at all. They use uh, EM and uh, full waveform seismic. They impose petrophysical. Petrophysical also uh, constrained and bought by Abubakar et al. Using CSEM and uh, seismic full waveform. Uh, we have Jelanov et al. These guys are from Utah and they they they, they do more of gradient constraint. And they use gravity and magnetic gradient constraint. And Jira et al. also was a student of uh, Professor Jedano and here on gravity, magnetic, and uh, they impose the uh, Gramian constraints. And uh, more camp at all, 2011, they use three methods actually. So it depends on your, what, your targets. If you fully understand it, you can combine even more than that. So the first method used by them was MT, second gravity, and then seismic refraction. And they imposed and compared two different constraints, the mathematical direct relation between the, the, the model parameters, and they also have a cross gradient uh, imposed there. Now, mono model, this slide shows the mono model examples that have been published. Um, like I said, this one just looks out for one model parameter. Uh, they may have two different methods or the same method or similar method. Yeah, so you have a boost of, you see DC magneto, magneto telluric, you're just looking for resistivity. TM and Stone DJ DC method, uh, there is no constraint there, you just lump them together. Sun so 2013, you have time domain airborne electromagnetic data and the frequency domain airborne electromagnetic data. This one's uh, trying to complement the dif differences in resolution. Uh, I did this, uh, I, you know, Goomba 2019, I published uh, the time domain airborne EM and frequency domain airborne uh, EM with premium constraint. I was going to look for the same model, which is the resistivity or conductivity. And the Ogumbo et al., uh, we use the gravity and the magnetic. We try to invert for coincident geometry uh, where they have the same coordinates because coordinates are the same for, for, for the survey area. So uh, they cannot change. So if one method is giving you a different geometrical expression, then you have to reject it because uh, they don't have to be different. And that is going to be very useful in plate tectonics, at accurate monitoring of plate tectonics, if we are able to get it well. And we have a Goomba et al. 2021. You have gravity, and then the first horizontal derivative of the gravity, you can compute that. We computed that mathematically. You don't have to have um, uh, another data. Even the legacy data, you can just compute this from that, and then you impose some constraints to help you accurately invert coincident geometry. So these are, these are some of the things that we have done with this mono model multi-field inversion with a Gramian constraint so that we can enhance our confidence at accepting or rejecting solutions afterwards. So uh, I have, although there are several applications of the mono model Gramian constraint joint version that I've worked on. I will present just one case, and that's uh, Ogumbo 2019, the result that I got there, so that we have something uh, within the limited time. So that leads me to the next item, uh, which is the Gramian constraint multi physics inversion. And I'm going to give 
this synthetic example, and thereafter I give a few data example. Um, this is the publication uh, with the Earth and the Space Science uh, Journal, the AGU Journal there. And uh, the, the article is there. I'm not going to go into the details of parameter set with that because of time here. And, but I'll just share the results and how we do that. So we, we talk about gramian constraint joints inversion. And the formulation is found in year 2013. Uh, if we look at equation four, and this is like uh, the, the data, the computer data, and you have the forward operator here for multiple data set. Uh, it runs from one to n, and that is a non-linear forward operator. And this one is the observer or the computed one. And for convenience, we can we can use dimensional weighted model parameters. Uh, given by equation five, and that is uh, this WIM is the corresponding linear operator of model weighted. You can just put one if you if you are sure of the weight, but uh, if you know the weight as well, the specific one you can as well use it. So the 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 gradient of a system of model parameters. So if you have the the model parameters from let's say the uh, frequency airborne electromagnetic data. You have another model uh, resistivity structure from uh, time domain electromagnetic. Uh, you, you put them together, and so they form a system of model parameters like this. Uh, so the gramian is the determinant of the grain gram matrix of a set of functions. So you need to form a grain matrix and then you find a determinant that will give you the the um, the gradient and that is given in equation six and where this symbol is the dot product of m1 and m2 in this case so the gradient provides a measure of correlation between the the frame model parameters or the attributes because it's a projection of one model on the other model that's the dot product and by imposing additional requirements of the minimum of the gremia in the regularized inversion, we generally obtain multi-modal inverse solution with enhanced correlation between the different model parameters or attributes. So you, you can impose attributes, the same attribute, the same models. You can you can have several of that. Um, but because I have um, two methods, uh, the frequency domain airborne EM data and the time domain airborne EM data. So the N in my case is two. So uh, I can adapt this equation uh, to, uh, to my own case. So that's, that's why equation seven has reduced to M1 and M2 here when I runs from one to two. And the M1 and M2 in my case are the logar logarithm of the receptivity of the time and frequency domain airborne EM data respectively. And that's the gram matrix is formed from the dot product of that. And so we, I'm sure we are familiar with all of these uh, formulation already discussed this. And the second term is the regularization term uh, scaled by the regularization parameter alpha. Uh, we have the the grim, the grimian, scaled by the weight beta here, uh, like I showed in the previous uh, equation in equation three. So the you can consult the the publication itself for the way to reduce this, and then you you formulate it in a way that you can apply the iterative regularized conjugate gradient method, or you can consult the Jordan of 2015. The details are in that. So after this. We, we can solve for M1 and M2 to improve the image. Now I go to the synthetic example of the resistivity structure in figure one is a true resistivity structure model. And uh, the, it has a 500 ohm meter block on the right and the 30 ohm meter block uh, both bearing
varied in the background receptivity of 100 ohm meter. Uh, the metals that we use are close to the, 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 the metals used to acquire the field data. So the, the parameter set up here is for us to learn how to learn from the synthetic model and then transfer it to the field data for analysis. Uh, so the, the resolve system is used to acquire the frequency domain airborne electromagnetic data. It was flown at the altitude of 20 meters with horizontal receiver offset of 7.93 meters. Uh, acquires the horizontal coupled inner in phase and quadrature responses at five frequencies. Uh, the time domain system is a sky tank uh, flown at the altitude of 40.55 meters, and the station spacing is 13.26 uh, meters. The off time is 4.167 milliseconds. The receptivity model has uh, seven data points. Uh, the number of the layers is six, and the layer thickness is five meters. Um, uh, we perform 10 standalone iterations preceding joint inversion, and uh, the noise level we increase from zero from zero to three percent to check the robustness of the results. And now I go to the results. So the or the joint inversion is preceded by standalone. Inversion, 10 iterations. So the standalone iteration after 10 iteration is shown on the first row. You see that uh, without a noise, and that is a, this is this. Now, if you perform this inversion without joint inversion, and they are supposed to give you the same results, all with high correlation. Uh, this is not correlating at all. You see the smearing on the top of the block. For the time domain, uh, because it's, it doesn't have a resolution in the near surface, but uh, you have the uh, reasonably high resolution from the frequency domain. That then there's a confusion. This the same model is producing different results. Why should it be so? That's what uh, is that's the non-uniqueness problem. So if we do not know the true results, it's difficult for us to go with this in real life because you have two data set giving you two different results that's supposed to be the same. So that's the, so, but when you see the, the joint inversion, uh, noiseless on the, for the, for both time domain and frequency domain, you see the high correlation of results. If, if you go for either of them, you are fine because both of them are uh, identifying the blocks that you are interested in. So that is the beauty of applying this uh, Grimian constraint. So there is a high resolution there. Now, what, what about uh, when we increase the noise content? Uh, for 1% and 3% noise, random noise, uh, figure three show the result after the joint inversion. Even in the presence of noise, we still see the correlation that is very high among the, of the chain of results there. Now I show uh, the correlation plots, correlation correction plots, the data misfeed and uh, for the noiseless and the 3% random noise. This is uh, with iteration. Now this, the black one is the standalone, the 10 iterations for the standalone inversion. And you see for the different noise content, the standalone also behaves differently. And the, the maximum correlation coefficients for them is uh, 90. Uh, for, for models that is supposed to have 100% correlation and you have 90. So that is not, Reliable. In fact, it's even lower for uh, the noiseless and the one percent noiseless. So, but as soon as Gremian is activated, Gremian constraint lifts up the correlation coefficient almost. I mean, almost close to the one hundred percent in the first few iterations. And by the end of the iteration, the joint inversion, uh, you see that the correlation has 
improve up to 100% for the noise noise, and then it's lower for the all uh, the noisy data of course we expect that to happen because it doesn't fit the noise in that data and that is also shown in the data mix media as soon as the, the premium kicks in there you see the 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 rms or the data mix feed first jumps up because the gremlin is trying to correct and to redirect the solution along the along the path that will lead to a unique solution. So that's that's that. And then we have the cross plot uh, for the frequency resistivity ohm and as well as the time domain resistivity. You see for the standalone, which is blue, the scatter is wider, but for the the joint inversion constrained by the gremia, you're falling on the, the straight line, telling you that there's a background 100 ohm meter and there is one low resistivity and there is another one high resistivity block there. So for the 3% noise, it's still the same distribution, but you have wider uh, standard deviation from the line there, which is also reasonable because uh, this is like a real life and the forecast is still there. Gramian constraint bring a lot of forecast and high resolution into the joint inversion. Uh, check the data we see well, feet uh, for the synthetic airborne EM. We did it. This the figure five shows the overlay, and we can see that um, while the solution is giving us good answer, it's also fitting the data, meaning that the 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 grand uh, objective function, the parametric function, is minimized. Okay, now the, the last section before the conclusion is the field electromagnetic data from Book Panong Irrigation District. And um, like I said, the resource system was used and the high moment sky time also was used to acquire the time domain, the resource system for the frequency domain. Ever. And the, we have the, the acquisition parameters, altitude for the uh, frequency domain the resource system is 33.46 meter and the horizontal receiver offset is 7.86 and uh, the i moment sky time is shown at the altitude of 39.8 meters with the horizontal receiver offset of 12.4 of time is 4.167 like we have used in the synthetic example uh, the methods uh, at time domain and the uh, uh, frequency domain airborne EM and the data for that are that is that are used up were acquired over the highly salinized book panong irrigation district south Australia and they were not acquired at the same time they were acquired at uh, uh, the time domain was acquired in 2006 Two years later, the frequency domain was acquired for uh, for different purposes, and so there was a two-year time lapse between the two data sets, and that is going to pose a lot of a uh, problem for joint inversion that requires coincidence points. There, so the the resistivity model that we used, we just selected ten data points because there were not too many coincidence points after after two years. A lot of uh, erosion. Yeah, the, I use the number of layers I, that I use is 14. Uh, I performed the six standalone iteration that preceded 10 joint inversion iteration. Now, the results for that is shown in the figure six. Uh, we can uh, see the figure 6a shows the standalone without the gremium. And why the figure 6B shows uh, the joint inversion with the gremium. Uh, with the, the blue line, the blue line is for the frequency, while the red one is, uh, uh, is for the time domain results. So we see the standalone inversion with visible weak correlation. They are not correlating. Everyone is just going their way. It's not focused. Uh, 
but uh, the joint inversion immediately that the joint inversion and agreement kicks in. You see the focusing telling you that the common the common resistivity structure has been defined by this. And uh, the differences between them here uh, will suggest the time lapse uh, changes because it's uh, the data we acquired in the space of two years. And so we can attribute the differences here to the time lapse changes. Otherwise, the focus is extremely uh, visible. And it's apparent that the gradient constraint synergizes the inversion towards a common unique result. And so this the joint inversion result suggests that the book Ponong regression district has a background resistivity of one ohm meter, uh, which is still largely unaffected by the salinization because it is, uh, the district is a um, salinization district. And you can see that uh, in the basement here, uh, the, the resistivity structure has never has not been thoroughly changed as in compared with the near surface over the two years. And that's, that's the, uh, the lead to inference uh, I can make from that. Uh, so the Gramian constraint enforces the correlation between the resistivity models to focus the solution towards high confidence interpretation. Now that the field data feed is this, uh, we can, we, we see that there is a high heating result from the field data and the computed data after the joint inversion. And uh, finally for that, uh, the data misfit for the standalone time, standalone frequency domain, you see that uh, the result was going this way. And then once the, the agreement kicks in, and then it takes everything down. And why that is happening, the correlation also jumps from, the correlation coefficient jumps from 25% and close to 95%. It's, it's not up to 100% because of the noise in the field data. And this is the uh, scatter plot that we generated. The blue one is the standalone without cross gradient, I mean, without uh, agreement constraint. Why the the blue one, uh, the red one is the joint inversion result with the Gramian constraint. Now to conclude, I uh, I like to say that uh, the multi physics from the frequency and the time domain airborne EM data has been jointly inverted with the Gramian constraint, which is the dot product of the two resistivity model vectors. And the Gramian constraint will synergize the linear correlation between the resistivity models to produce more reliable images than those from standalone inversion. The application of the concept of the synthetic data proves the compelling role of the Gramian influence in the joint inversion, even in the presence of noise. That increasing linear correlation coefficient and decreasing the data misfit with iteration is further ensured by the Gramian constraint. Moreover, the frequency and the time domain AM uh, data from the Brook Ponong Irrigation District, South Australia, have been jointly invited with Gramian constraint, which reveals a resistivity background of one of meter with a salinized lower resistivity values near surface shallow depths. Uh, these are the references that I cited. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Brain Korean 21.4 program. And uh, this source is, uh, uh, the data source is acknowledged as well uh, by C0. And the, the link to that is, is shown there. And I would like to acknowledge the, the, the organizer of the MTNet, Imina. Thank you so much. And also for, for you too. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh,
for those of you who are a bit surprised to hear me, uh, I wasn't here for the beginning of the talk. I had some technical difficulties, but I was lucky enough to catch the, the second part um, of, the, of the talk. So please, as usual, everybody write your questions in the Q&A section and in the meantime i'm I, I think i have a few questions for you if that's okay all right um so my first one is a technical one um and maybe that's because i missed the beginning but for your forward modeling is this a 1d um forward modeling or do you do a full uh, you, well the examples you just showed with sort of 2d uh, or multi-dimensional forward modeling Oh, okay. The, the data acquired is 1D. The Hukonong data is mm -hmm. uh, 1D. So it's just 1D. Uh, that's why the, the result shows the 1D plot there. And that's one of the benefits of um, Gremium because uh, over cross gradient, because cross gradient, the minimum sensor is 2D because if you look at the the stencil for computing the cross gradient. So you have to have a second dimension to compute that. If you don't, you use a pseudo, uh, pseudo geometry. But for Gramian, you it's dot product, 1D to 1D, one, one point to one point. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. So uh, to answer your question, it's just 1D because uh, the data acquired is 1D. Okay. And the same for the synthetics example, because there it was yes. sort of a 2D plot, but you, you do it column-wise um, yes. separately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I was going to transfer the understanding to, um, I mean, the, the experience of uh, the synthetic to the field data. So it's 1D2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I found your, your results, your, your field results very interesting. I and mean, it's... Uh, Something that I've been thinking about a bit recently is that in a, in a way you get more information from the fact where the joint division doesn't produce the same model than where, the, where it sort of put things together, right? Because you're saying they were acquired at different times. Um, and so if you go back, yeah, if you show the results for, the, for that, um, I can't pronounce the name, uh, that irrigation district the the models so yeah if you look at your station one on the right hand side in your um in your joint inversion results yes there are clear discrepancies between the red and the blue curve um and you said that that's because um there is some change in in salinity probably um yes. So in, in a way, but that's, of course, violating the Gramian constraint. Yes, the Gramian would want to, to make those things sort of much more similar and use a correlation. So I find it very interesting that the, the information comes also from the fact that where the, the Gramian is sort of cannot be enforced by the inversion. Do you know? No, um, the Gramian, the, the general concept and the philosophy of Gramian is that whatever the relationship is between the two or more parameters uh, interacting is going to tell you. So if the, if the formula is M equals to N, which is when the boats are acquired at the same time, that is, the, the scaling is one. So if time has elapsed and the formula has reduced to M equals to 0.8 N, Gremia will also tell you. So it's doing that. It's, it doesn't need any a priori. It fits it. It tells you at, a, at this point, there is 100% correlation. There's this 80% correlation due to time lapse and all of that. So Gremia is doing its own job. It's not, it's not, it doesn't even know if I'm combining two, uh, two metals that have 
uh, the same data. It just, it finds out the relationship. You don't need a priori information. Dreamer tells you what you are there. Yeah, yeah, no, what I was saying is, is even, even, I would say, independent of, you know, Gramian, cross gradient or whatever. But okay, maybe say it differently. If you look at, again, at your station one, yes, at, at depth, you have um, in your individual inversion between the red and the blue curve, you have quite a difference, right? So, yes, yes. yeah. And then it gets made the same um, for the joint inversion, yes? it is so it's sort of one or meters but one could argue like maybe we don't even have any resolution and we just take the average of the two yes and the gramian just sort of matches those so this is where the gramian sort of does its work but uh it, there there are questions surrounding us whereas if you look at that part where um where they the um, the structures if you want to so don't match yes that's something where the data says, okay, I cannot, I cannot create a correlation between the two. So in a, in a way, it is a, it's a very strong bit of information that you get from this. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, if the joint, if the standalone has already found what the Gremia will find, it doesn't mean Gremia is not working. No, no. That is not yeah, that's the that's the solution. So if the the difference in the station one result for the standalone is the same in the joint inversion, that's that's the result. So if it's not too much, that is the result. This will have been very nice if there was no time lapse between the data because so now everything has to be has to be excused and put on time lapse. But uh, the uh, that's that's the reason why the joint inversion of the synthetic example is more appropriate. So, but uh, this is the data that I have for the demonstration. If I have, sing, I mean, synchronous data, maybe that would have been so nice. But uh, uh, anything could have happened within two years, and uh, this is uh, because it's dyna is a dynamic system, a flow of the silent saline water. Yeah, so you don't know. It's just uh, when you freeze the time, this is the kind of conductivity and resistivity structure that I have at this moment in time. And so uh, I, I wouldn't want to say much to defend or to not to defend the Gremian here because uh, it's not, they are not acquired at the same time. So uh, this is just, uh, but the focusing is there when Gremian comes, everything has been brought together and then we have uh, yeah, no, and you're absolutely right. But what I'm trying to say to you, maybe, maybe I'm sort of not saying it the right way, is that you shouldn't see it so negatively. I think you you actually gain some valuable information. What you just said, yes, there is some change. It is mandated by the data, even with the Gramian that would want to make those things the same. Yes, I'm not just comparing individual inversions. Even with that, I cannot make those models the same. So the change that is indicated by the difference between the red and the blue line is likely caused by something and that's an information yes i mean you can interpret that you can, yes, you can yes, learn yes, something yes. about the earth from that that's what mm -hmm. i'm yeah. you know so I'm, oh, you know, all right that's what i was trying trying to to, to get at all right. um so far we don't have any yeah, if i could just uh, jump in with yeah. that conversation max it you know, the, both the frequency domain and, and time domain uh, systems are sensing electrical conductivity or uh, resistivity, but they're sensing it with different uh, resolution properties. And so unfortunately, we're looking at kind of a mixing here. We don't know whether those differences that you just showed us, if you can put that plot back up, uh, GD, we don't know whether oh, okay. those differences are, are differences due to resolution differences or due to differences in the two years time interval. And I think one thing you could do is try and do a joint inversion, but for a single parameter, for a single conductivity value and see, does that, can you do that for station one? And if you can't do that, then there has to have been conductivity variation. Uh, all right. Um, the, uh, on resolution differences, uh, there that has never been a serious issue that discourages the implementation of multi-phase inversion. 
In fact, it seems that it is a requirement for performing joint inversion, even for the multimodal example published already. Many of the multimodal examples that I mentioned, they use EM and seismic methods, which are apparently at different resolution scales. Mm -hmm. And yet the joint inversion philosophy suggests a complementary benefit when different multiple data sets or techniques are used. So it's, it's like a given that uh, they, they, they don't, they, uh, um, the resolution difference is not an issue with joint inversion. Somehow they are going to complement and that's one of the strengths of the joint inversion. You yeah, but I, think there's, I think there's a difference, Jide, if you're joint inversion, if you're jointly inverting seismics in the end because they're seeing different physical parameters, whereas both frequency domain and time domain are seeing exactly the same parameter. They're seeing an electrical resistivity. And it's quite clear looking at those standalone plots that one method has got much more con uh, conductive lower part below 30 meters than the, than the other. So there is, there is fundamental resolution differences between FDEM and TDEM. And so the question I have is whether can you in fact indeed get a single conductivity model that would fit both data sets at each station? And if you can't, then that speaks to um, differences over the two years. It's unfortunate these are not exactly the same time. Now it would take away this uh, yeah. fourth yeah, dimension. The, yes. If I see, if I have a, a synchronized data set, maybe I will have a more concrete result to be sure. But uh, researchers, we are always constrained for data. Sometimes it's difficult to find. Yes. All we right. Have I have a... A... I'm sorry. I think someone is asking a question here. Yeah, I just wanted to read that out. So Peter ah, okay, Walker right. is asking, have you thought about using the gradients for the gradients of the model parameters analogously to the cross gradient method when multi-physics data sets are used? Yes, I have tried several ones, several, um, several combinations because uh, the, the gradient constraint framework uh, provides or the benefit of using that. But um, the, the correlation between the, the gradients is still one, because if M equals to N, if you find a gradient of them is the same. So, but I found this performing better than the, the use of the gradient, maybe because uh, I need to understand the parameter settings or something, but I have tried that. This outperforms the gradient. That's why I, I just stick with this one. Yeah, I mean, my thought on this would be that um, it really depends on the situation. Yes, you, you, you can expect a good correlation between the resistivities. That's what you actually enforced. And I su suspect you saw less uh, similarity between the models with the gradient because i think the gradient would be a weaker connection between the two map models in a way because you can always yeah. add a, a sort of a constant um without changing the gradients yeah i i think so um and because uh, it is so easy to to compute the cross grid i mean the Gramian for the 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 resistivity. Uh, I guess okay, maybe the cross gradient. I I have done the cross gradient on its own, and uh, this one I I just I go for this one. This is better than the gradient. Um, maybe parameter setting or the it becomes the amplitude becomes very small. The magnitude becomes small that you cannot even I cannot even see anything in that. But it's, uh, it's going to be a very interesting research to, to find how that can work out and then compare with uh, cross gradient and see which one does better.
Okay, uh, I think just another question came up. Uh, Alvas Fanai, thank you for your presentation. Do you examine your algorithm and codes on big data, such as aeromagnetic data? Is there good depth resolution in distinguished models for anomaly sources and airborne data? Oh, okay. Uh, big data such as aeromagnetic data, is there a good depth resolution and distinguished model for um, anomaly sources in airborne data? I've not used the um, airborne aeromagnetic data. Um, I just uh, the magnetic data example that I gave was uh, was synthetic, and so I've not I've not really used this one. Uh, what we are talking about here is uh, airborne frequency and uh, time domain electromagnetic, not magnetic data itself. So, but for the magnetic example and the gravity. So example is, is synthetic that I use for now. Okay. At least at this point, at C, yeah. So Abbas says, thank you. Um, at, at this point, it seems there are no more open questions, but I think we had a sort of good and interesting discussion. Um, so unless somebody is really quick, I think we will close the MNA for today. So thank you, Jude, for this for this presentation and yeah, some some interesting results. Um, and we will see you all hopefully next week again. When Alan, help me out. Who's speaking next week? Uh, Hans Rudi Mara. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be interesting, I'm sure. Okay. So thank you, everyone, and have a good week. And you too. Bye bye.